Okay, 1476. So we got a pretty serious opponent. All right, so d4, we continue uh, to play Queen's Gamma Declined. Much to people's disappointment, but nonetheless, I think it's it's going to be our gateway into, uh, into more interesting openings. Now, in this position, I'm going to introduce you guys to an interesting little move order trick. Um, it's sometimes good to start with the move bishop e7. That's another very... Andrew Tang plays it like this. Of course, this prevents bishop g5. I mean, it. it's an interesting little move order. And if white goes knight f3, then you can go knight f6, and you avoid certain annoying lines of the queen's gamut. Okay, so c takes d5 is the other line of bishop f4. That's the other uh, the other way to play this. The munchback, thank you for the prime. Okay, so knight f3 is, is of course... Uh, a completely viable move. Now here you can you can play knight f6, and that's totally uh totally valid. But the way that you know the cool people play is that they'll they'll play c6 here and then reposition the bishop from e7 to d6. It looks like it wastes a lot of tempi, but it's it's the setup that a lot of uh good players in this position try to adopt. And oftentimes, bishop f4 is going to be played, and then we play bishop d6 and offer the trade of dark squared bishops, which uh, is supposed to be good for black in this position, just because the bishop can sometimes, in, in such positions, be uh, just a little bit awkward. It, it often doesn't have a good parking spot. It's just sort of chilling on e7. And there we go, bishop d6. This is the main line. Now, you guys might be looking at this and saying, okay, I get the idea, but you're not developing any of your pieces. How can you expect to get away with that? And again, it all has to do with the state of the center because we're so solid, right? We have a pawn chain. The center is relatively closed. White's not going to play e4 anytime soon because white's king is also in the center. Uh, so we can afford to make two or three moves with the same piece. Don't be obsessed with that rule. Look at the position and you can often determine intuitively whether you can get away with uh, this kind of play or not. All right. What if bishop g5? Yeah, then we can play knight e7. We can play we can we can play knight e7 here and or or well knight f6 is again not in the spirit of the position. Alright, so queen takes d6. And oftentimes this bishop is now positioned on f5. In fact, that's the move we're gonna play. And you'll you'll see in this line uh, positions with two knights against two knights, which is not so common, where both pairs of bishops have been traded, but you'll see it in this line. And that's always a very... I was going to say material imbalance, but it's actually a balance. So why are we going bishop f5 before developing the knights? Because if we allow white to put the bishop on d3, then we will no longer have the opportunity to go bishop f5. We could also go bishop g4. Absolutely viable uh, developing move as well. But one that is often overrated by uh, players. And I'll, I'll show you guys why bishop g4 is slightly inaccurate in this position after the game. No, no, e3 is fine. I mean, no, this is fine for white. It's not a mistake. It's just, I mean, black has equalized. That doesn't mean white has made any mistakes. It's just white has not played this in the most ambitious way. No, uh, we are not trying to play b6, c5 here. We, we are keeping this pawn chain. If we go b6, c5, white's going to take it, and we're only bringing trouble to ourselves because we're going to be weakening the d5 square. This is not the position where you want to go for that plan. Our, our subsequent moves are going to be to develop both knights, knight d7, knight f6. Castle maybe get one of the knights to e4. And I realize this position is quite boring, but you have to know how to play these types of positions in order to transition to more complex ones, in my opinion. And that's the premise of the speedrun. It's not always going to be the most interesting games, but hopefully they'll, they'll always be instructive. Okay, so small subtlety. I like to play knight d7 before knight f6 because if we play knight f6 first, perhaps we're allowing knight e5. So let's prevent knight e5, and then develop the other knight to f6. We have a question about queen b3. Yeah, queen b3, you can play rook b8. No problem. Queen b3, rook b8. And then remember, you might be like, well, wait a second. Then the, the rook's tied down to defending the pawn, but <laughs> the queen is tied down to attacking the pawn, right? You're, you're very happy to keep the queen occupied like that. Okay, so knight, knight f6. So far, so good. We've solved our opening problems. Position is very comfortable. And um, after we castle, 
everything's going to be in, in its proper place. So far, White has not done anything terribly wrong. I mean, again, he has not played this very ambitiously, but of course, look at White's position. There's no targets. White is very solid. Yeah, so as I said, after queen b3, I think we're going to go rook b8. I, I don't love the move b6 in general in such positions because it softens up the, the c6 square. Why create an extra target for, for white? Unless you're playing c5, which, as I explained, we're not really doing at the moment. We can also throw an h6 uh, aimed against knight h4 in London style. Yeah. What would I do with white? Well... White's got the classic minority attack, a3, b4, b5. That would be one thing I would consider. Um, but it's, it, yeah, that's the, the the reason that we've solved our opening problem. It's not so easy for White to find a, a good plan here. I would consider going knight h4, actually. It's not a move that, that's in the purview of most, you know, 1,400 players. Okay, yeah, it is it is crazy to castle queen's head, and I'll explain why after the game. Not entirely crazy, but... It's inadvisable, I'll put it that way. Queen d2. Okay. Yeah, there is Einstein. -y. Uh I'll, I'll explain that as well. One second. Okay. So, first of all, I don't want to rush with knight e4. Because, okay, knight e4, we're going to have... Maybe we do. Because if, if knight e4, knight takes e4, I want to take with a pawn. And that's a typical... Typical... Um, kind of motif in these positions to take with a pawn and then open up the d5 square for the other knight. I think you guys have probably seen this before. Yeah, we can play rook f8. We can play something neutral. Uh, let's start with rook f8 and then let's see how, whether we want to play knight e5, knight e4 maybe on the next move. So you can see that he's spending a lot of time here, not really able to generate a good plan. Is it okay to trade your bishop if he goes knight h4? Yeah, I mean, knight h4, bishop g6 is fine, but I would prefer to keep the bishop, so we might go bishop e6. And then you might say, well, we got our bishop away from its most active square, but also the knight on h4 is quite awkward, so it's uh, double-sided, if you will. Well, a3, we can go a5, so it's not even easy for white to organize b4, and rook b1 is impossible because we have a bishop on f5. So what I would probably do with white is go knight h4, bishop e6, and then rook a b1 to try to prepare the minority attack. Yeah, or maybe bishop d3, even though it loses a tempo. That's not a move he's likely to play because he's already played bishop e2. Rook e1. Rook e1 is neither good nor bad. It doesn't really do anything. Whereas rook e8 occupies more squares. But there is a pawn on e3, so for him to put a rook on e1 is not as sensible, though he does it. And I think now is the perfect time for knight e4. Now is the perfect time for knight e4, because after knight takes e4, pawn takes e4, the knight can no longer drop back to e1. The knight has problems. You might have to go like this. That's obviously passive. Or like this, and then the knight on h4 is going to kind of be trapped there. So... It's starting to get just a little bit unpleasant for white. I, I don't think black is significantly better, but definitely slight, slightly better. Okay. We've got multiple approaches in a position like this. We can play very positionally. And the positional approach would be would entail getting a knight to d5, knight f6, or knight b6, and then knight d5, just putting it on that semi-outpost. Um, I don't like the move c5 here because then white's going to go rook a to d1. We don't want to open up the center because we've got more to gain from the center being closed. Yeah, knight f1, hg3 is a very high level idea here. But we can also take a more aggressive stance and play a move like queen g6 and start creating threats against the king. Um, let me think about this for a second. We can also lift our rook through e6 to g6. But the funny thing is after rook e6, white can play knight f1. Very strong move. And meet rook g6 with knight g3, closing down the g file. So we can also take a middle ground approach. We can go queen g6, king h1, and then knight f6, knight e5. Or we could go rook e6, 
And after knight f1, we could go rook h6 and try to get the rook onto that square. Um, but I I want to play positionally in this speedrun. I, I don't want us to rush any attacking ideas until we've fully cemented our advantage. This is not going to go anywhere. We'll have this later too. Let's start by getting our knight to d5. And a lot of people view this kind of patient play as being lame, like I wanted to attack. But this put yourself in your opponent's shoes. This makes it incredibly hard for white to just to breathe. And probably knight b6 was more accurate because it prevented bishop c4. The trade of bishop for knight is probably good for black, though, because it leaves him just with this very, very passive knight. And our bishop is quite nice here. It can sacrifice itself on h3 later. It's not a bad bishop at all. Yeah, knight f1, knight g3 is an idea on the Ray Lopez and the Juco Piano, but it's the, here the knight is coming from a completely different direction. Well, <laughs> if there was an if there was a way to know when the attack wouldn't work, then there wouldn't be any failed attacks. All right, rook c1, and we can complete our maneuver with knight d5. And notice how this is holding the c-file completely, so that rook is also pretty much useless. Though I would consider going rook c5 here and at least trying to create some activity. What's the knight doing on d5? Yeah, that's a <clears throat> hard question to answer. It's not that it's doing something specific. It's just occupying a central square and exerting control over a lot of squares on the board. For example, it's preventing b4. And also, you never know when the knight can jump out to f4. So it's a good idea to think of pieces as, okay, what is the piece doing here? But you shouldn't limit yourself in that way. a3. All right, so clearly b4 is being prepared. And kind of automatic response here is a5. Now, if I were white, I would I would go before I would consider going before anyway. That's a difficult move to play, though. That's that's not a move which a lot of people will come up with here. And I'll explain the lines after the game. Right. And sometimes an eight hundred makes a GM move. So again, queen g6, I think you guys are over overestimating it because queen g6, king h1. Queen g6 is sort of one move-itis. It creates a one move threat, and that's all it does. Rook c2. Okay, so I've talked about this before, but let's begin by permanently preventing white from playing b4. How can we do that? We can make a move here that essentially for all of eternity will prevent white from going b4. Yeah, we can play the move a4, but... I'm going to amend what I just said a little bit. We're not in a rush to play a4 because now b4 is not even close to being a threat. We can play a takes b4 and the rook on a1 is going to hang. So let's begin by getting a rook to g6 finally. And when the time comes, we can always play a4 and meet b4 with en passant, which totally takes the sting out of it. Okay. Yeah, he can play rook c5 and then, and then we're going to play a4 because that attacks the pawn. Bishop g4, good move. Very good move. Um, this forces the bishop train, and it leaves us with a knight versus knight situation where, of course, our knight is going to be a lot better than white's knight. But this was nice. Okay, we trade, and the knight comes back into the game. Okay, so let me think about this for a second. How do we want to play this? There's many ways we can do this, but I like one in particular. F5, unfortunately, does not force him back. This is a very common mistake. F5 allows knight e5, and we certainly do not want to give away an outpost, a counter outpost on e5. And don't forget that, you know, the knight isn't automatically going to move backwards. In fact, in order to push the knight backwards, we have to do it in a very careful fashion. If we go h5, we still allow knight e5. And in that position, if we go f6, the knight reroutes to c4, where I have to say it's positioned quite sensibly. So what we can do is play f6 first, and then h5, and then the knight has to, is pushed back to h2, and then we can play f5 and open up the floodgates to g6. Well, it's this weird 
it's a little bit slow, but it's not like white is doing too much on the other side of the board. So we can afford this. So first we play f6 to prevent knight e5. Shut out that, shut off that valve. Then we play h5 to chase the knight back to h2. And because the move f6 had the drawback of blocking the pieces along the, the sixth rank, then we push the f pawn forward and we can even push it to f4. Okay, he does the he does our work for us. Great. Uh, now we can certainly we can play f5 without playing h5, which is even better. Okay, now he's getting them trying to get the knight to g3, which is gonna be a little bit too late. Alright. So how do we want to continue the pressure? <laughs> Many ways that we can proceed here. Um, first of all, we can play rook fa. We can get this rook into the game and prepare f4. Okay, the, the most traditional plan in such positions is to prepare f4. We can play f4 immediately. We can play f4 immediately, but I like putting a rook behind a pawn like that. Of course, rook, a, rook f8 gives up the pawn on a5, which in one of my over-the-board games, I probably would not fear. But in the context of the speedrun, let's begin by playing a4, just so that we're not giving any counterplay. He's probably going to go knight g3, and then we're going to go rook f8 and try to push f4. And there's never a, an algorithm for determining when you care about such a pawn. Sometimes you might sacrifice this pawn and checkmate your opponent. Sometimes you might sack a pawn like this, and the attack fails, and you get into some endgame, and you're a pawn down. And then you're asking, you're thinking to yourself, why would I just not play a move like this? Well, maybe if you play a move like this, then you give your opponent longer to mount uh, a defense. Yeah, rook g6 is good. Rook f8, f4, any any attacking move on the king side is essentially good. He's down to a minute also on the clock. Yeah, rook g6 is great. Rook g6, there's knight g3 though, so I wouldn't be too in love with that move. Rook g6, there's knight g3 closing down the g file. I wouldn't go crazy for rook g6. Rook ac1, yeah, aimless. And now we can complete, a, you know, continue assembling our pieces on the king side. We're about to play f4 and break through. And guess what? Then the knight could maneuver to d3. f4 is coming. White could play g3, and we might even still play f4 and just sack everything and open the king up. Yeah, he might have to play g3, but g3 is just so weakening. We can also play h5, h4 there. Yeah, we certainly don't want to go b5. That, that, that gives purpose to white's rooks, exactly. Okay, so knight h2. F4, probably he wants to meet with knight g4. Okay, so what comes to mind? If we want to play very prophylactically, we want to prevent everything. Yeah, we go h5 and f4. Again, the same idea. One of the pawns stops the knight. The other pawn does the, the pushing. <laughs> and now f4. Finally, we're ready. He takes f4, and guess what? This knight on d5, it is, it is waited so patiently this whole time, and now... A knight is the hero of the attack. Because now rook g6 is going to be pretty much totally devastating. Something is going to collapse here. No doubt about that. Maybe even knight t3 here. Something is going to something is going to give. Something is going to give. Okay. So let's not rush because rook g6 would be an impulse. Oh my goodness, but we have a beautiful sequence there. Actually, wait, let me think about this. Wow, we have a, a very, very pretty way to transform our advantage. Um, in case, if, if after rook g6, white plays rook g3. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. I probably would have gone knight d3 to slice the rook away for, off of the, the third rank and to attack the d4 pawn. Yes. Okay, so what do I see here? Well, there's no fork on e2 immediately, but I think you guys are already seeing essentially the start of this tactic. Yeah, we begin by taking. This is classic transformation of the advantage, right? We Positional domination now turns into a material advantage. Queen takes d4 check. 
But we're not just winning a pawn. I wouldn't go for this if we won just a pawn. We're winning two pawns. This is what makes this really pretty. This is a very typical pattern, but here we have something really nice. What am I talking about? So don't take the rook quickly, because then knight takes f1. If you think about this, yeah, we can play knight takes g3, then come back to e2, and only then we can take the queen. We can also take the rook first. Yeah, I mean, taking the rook first makes a lot of sense, because why not trade more pieces when we're up two pawns? Nice. And now we're up two pawns in a knight endgame. It's completely winning. All we have to do is bring our king to the center and push the e-pawn, push our pawn majority. It really doesn't matter. We can win this in many different ways. Okay, so if we want to be, if we want to be like super, super clinical here, although, I mean, I would start by playing b5 and just, uh, but, you know, essentially preparing our queen side pawns to, to be pushed. Okay, so... Again, you don't. It doesn't really matter even what you do here. You can take on g4. You can play h4. I like I like keeping pawns on the board when possible. So I like a move like h4. It also stops the king from coming to g3, and we can always support that pawn with g5. And if white plays g5, then white's going to have a weakness on g5. And we can win this in 800 different ways. We can bring the king here. We can put play c5 b4. Okay, so in such positions, the least risky approach is to keep your king in the center so that in case something happens and white infiltrates, you can always use your king as a, a last uh, method of resort. So what I would do is try to use this knight to win the h3 pawn, which is, of course, white's biggest weakness. Yeah, a lot of you are indicating this knight f3 and then either knight g5 or knight g1 doesn't matter. And uh, probably, no, it does matter. Knight g1 is more accurate because... Knight g1 is actually much more accurate because then if he goes knight f5, we can go g5 and we don't have to give away the h1. Yeah, knight f5, g5. So that's very important, actually. And kudos to, to our opponent. He's trying trying everything he can. Now, there comes a point in such endgames when you have to stop caring about pawns. Like here, I, I made a mental judgment and I'm like, he's going to go here and here and here. We're going to let him take all of these pawns because I know that I'm going to promote one of my pawns. I just know that, even without calculation. I mean, th there's nothing to calculate here. Just going to go h3, h2, e3, e2, whatever. That was nice. Okay, we can go king f4 also. Yeah, so you can go e3 here. You can promote. You can go king f4 and chase the knight away. I like that approach. Okay, take it. Move the knight back. And then make a queen, make another queen. Again, don't pre-move in these positions because this is not stalemate, but it's close. This is not stalemate. That's a check. And now, okay, I'm checkmate. Again, it's easy to stalemate in a position like this. I'm looking for mate in two. It's not so easy to find, but oh yeah, queen e8 check is, is the mate in two. Nice. That was a satisfying positional game. Wow, a lot to talk about. I've got about 15 minutes. Very nice. Uh, and as you can see, the Queen's Gambit can allow you to produce these kinds of games. So Bishop e7, again, a little subtlety in the opening. Knight f6 is the traditional move, and then Bishop g5 leads to the main line. Bishop e7 doesn't allow Bishop g5. And if Knight f3, as far as I remember, yeah, like, let me see. Now, most, here, here you play knight f6, and after bishop g5, white is already committed to putting the knight on f3, which is a little bit of a commitment. Okay. So, either way, c, d, e, d, and now knight f3 is, is a little bit toothless. Uh, bishop f4 is the main line. c6, e3, and yeah, bishop f5 is the most popular move, but bishop d6, which Andrew Tang likes to play, is also very popular, trading dark sword bishops. Yeah, after bishop f5, queen b3 is not, not dangerous here. You can just go queen b6. Uh, in fact, here white's main move is g4, and this leads to some very, very sharp complications. Anyways, you can, you can uh, explore this opening on your own using opening explorer and stuff. Okay, so knight f3. Um, c6, 
And still bishop f4 um, would essentially transpose to the main line. Oh, which she plays. Bishop f4, bishop d6. Oh, so this is interesting. Thank you, Z-capped for the tier one. This is interesting. Uh, according to the opening explorer, bishop g5 is, is the main move. So VP Bombazi, you called it. Bishop, bishop g5 is the main move. People don't like trading bishops. And now the main line continues. Knight e7. You can play knight f6 too, but that is a little bit weird. Now queen c2 most people play. So you can see they're trying to stop uh, the bishop from coming to f5. Um, and now f6, 72 games. Bishop h4, bishop f5. Queen d2. Knight d7, e3. And you get this kind of slightly souped up Queen's Gambit decline where the Knights are on e7 and d7. Interesting position. Uh, probably a, maybe a tiny bit better for white just because this pawn on f6 is a little bit awkward, but uh, this is how the main line goes. All right. Einstein asks, what if white prevents bishop f5 with bishop d3? Well, he can't <laughs> because the moment he goes bishop e3, we, e3, we went bishop f5. So we, we get that in there before he can get his bishop out to d. I mean, white can still play bishop d3. In fact, that's the main line in this position. Thank you, Sky at Night, gifting to Einstein. -y. But here we can either take or we can go knight e7, kind of trading on our own terms. And it's equal. And it's equal. What's weird about knight f6? Well, it's not that it's weird. This transposes to a weird line of the queen's gamma decline where... The bishop is on d6. In such positions, the bishop belongs on e7. That's the only only thing that's slightly off about this position. Of course, you can play this as well. And it's a self-pin. Well, yeah, it's a self-pin, and you don't want to move your bishop back to e7 and waste empty anyways. Thank you, Mavin Star. Not that important. Uh, everything is possible here. So takes, takes, e3. Bishop f5, bishop b2. So a little bit of a toothless way of playing this with white. h3, castles, queen d2. Queen d2 is also, I, I wouldn't, necessarily put the queen on d2 because this walks walks into a potential knight e4 and this is what i'm trying to tr explain it's like the 1400s 1500s you'll see this pretty often it's not like they make big mistakes in the opening it's just that uh you know they'll they'll play in kind of a relatively toothless fashion just kind of making the moves making the prescribed moves that you learn you know early on you know queen d2 rook e1 rook d1 but they don't always make sense in every position so adapting to new positions is i think a skill that really starts to take shape around the time you're 19 1900 2000 it's just not an easy thing to do you know figuring out new ideas that you haven't seen before um not not today catalyst Moon. I, I i played probably for about a total of 18 hours <laughs> yesterday uh five bucks from Diage. I'm an alcoholic. Your streams have made my road to recovery easier. I'm very happy to hear that. Good luck. Um, queen d2. Rook fe8. Um, rook fe1. Another one of these moves. And now knight e4. So we decide to, to change the structure here. Oh yeah, queen b3. What would we have done against queen b3? Okay, so again, here I would play rook ab8. And as I explained during the game... Even though our rook is tied down to the pawn on b7, so is the queen. White's queen is also not doing anything other than pressuring that pawn, if that makes sense. I don't like to play b6 in such positions, because now he goes rook c1, and white has the ultimate plan of pressuring the c pawn. And if we go c5, I was talking about this as well, this leads to the hanging pawn structure in a very good version for white, because white instantly develops a lot of pressure, if that makes sense. What if queen b3, rook b8, bishop a4, queen a4, just a6? Just a6. And now b4 is no longer dangerous because we're controlling the square very nicely. White has to move the queen back and then play a4. That's a lot of moves. Um, Okay, so queen d2, rook f8, rook f1. Now we go knight e4. So after knight h4, bishop e6, we would have been threatening g5, trapping the knight. Thank you, free equal to sack with the tier one. And it's not so easy to extricate this knight from h4. Oh yeah, I was gonna thank you for reminding me. I even wrote it down and I didn't. I ignored it. So if we rewind back a little bit, why didn't we castle queenside? Well, the simple answer is because we've damaged our our pawn structure is good, but in the context of sheltering a king, it's not. We have a hook on c6. In fact, we, we're gonna get mated like in five moves here. Queen a4, for instance, hit the pawn. And now b4, b5 is so much stronger when the king is on the queen side. 
In the meantime, we haven't even gotten started on the other side of the board. We only have to play h6. White is very clearly much faster, and our, our king is just weaker. It's just a feeling you get. You look at this position, and you think, well, just feels bad for black. And I'm not saying you don't castle queenside in these positions. You often do. There are plenty of lines of the queen's gamma decline where you have opposite side castling. It's just that here, I don't like doing it with a pawn on c6. Okay, so castles, queen d2, rook f e, rook f e1, knight e4, knight f6. And as I was explaining, I was I was going to talk about a minority attack, this b4, b5. Uh, and this is the classic, classic plan in Karlsbad structures and in many queen's gamma decline positions. And the Karlsbad structure is when the Karlsbad structure, and we already had one of them, is the, the traditional Karlsbad is c takes d5 here. E takes d5, and this is called the Karlsbad structure. And this is where, by the way, this is where black wants to play bishop b7, not bishop b6. And this is where the, the old school plan is rook b1, b4, b5, kind of chiseling away at black's pawn chain. This is called the, the traditional minority attack. This is where that term comes from. Um... I was going to make a brief detour into discussing how to deal with the minority attack. Now, just for context, guys, books have been written on the Carlsbad structure. I, I listened to a lecture by Grandmaster Jan Gustafsson, which was about two and a half hours long, only on actually defending against the minority attack in the Carlsbad. Like, that's how complex this concept is. It's hard to summarize everything in one, one um, you know, five minutes or whatever, but I can give it a shot. There is a couple of ways of dealing with um, the Carlsbad structure. OneDrive is terror. I uninstalled it and then reinstalled it. Okay, so knight h2 back to the game. Knight f6. Like I explained, we're getting the knight to d5. Now, rook e6. Uh, a lot of you are falling in love with this. I don't like rook e6 here because we get the rook to g6. Now what? The knight gets to g3 in time. Okay, congrats. And all of a sudden, black is experiencing some troubles here because if we move the bishop back, then we give up the pawn on e4. So I wasn't a huge fan of rushing this. Okay, knight f6. Uh, would you consider bishop takes? Yeah, bishop takes c4 is possible, but I wanted to really show what happens when the pawn structure is changed like that. And I, I, I really liked the idea of pushing the knight away from, from f3. So yeah, bishop e4 keeps the structure and black is of course totally fine here, but I think d takes e4 is a better opportunity. Knight f6, knight d5, and a3 is met with a5. Yeah, so b4 here I think would have been a very good chance to gain counterplay. I mean, the point is very simple. If, if black just takes everything and then takes the pawn, then at the end of the line, this is such a typical idea, white has rook b1 and pinning the knight to the pawn on b7, white's going to win the pawn back with interest. So I was thinking about how to deal with that here. And what I came up with was perhaps not taking the rook on a1, but instead, like, for instance, knight takes before immediately. And, or, or there's another idea, which is to take on a1, and then after knight before rook b1 to go c5, exploiting the pin against white's queen. But... I don't know what happens here. Queen c3. I guess black plays b6 and keeps the extra pawn. No, so I guess I guess black is better here nonetheless. But it would have been an attempt to muddy things up. Thank you, Oats1284, gifting to bagels. So that was an idea. And it just speaks to the fact that you always have to consider, you know, even if your opponent quote-unquote prevents an idea, you have to consider what happens if you do it anyway. Back to the back to the game. So rook c2. And now rook e6. Now, now we get... We get the rook lift going. Now, there was an interesting detail. You might ask, well, wait a second. How is this? How is the situation changed now that uh, we put the knight on d5? Well, there is a, a detail here. In this position, after rook g6, knight g3, black has an additional resource. In fact, black has several resources. Black has a draw if he wants it. What am I thinking of? Think about how this knight on d5 could be used to attack the king side. What additional opportunity exists we could have done this without the knight on d5 but it wasn't as strong but it wasn't as strong who sees an interesting chance rook takes g3 yeah just rook g3 g queen g3 it's not really a sacrifice we already have a pawn for the exchange and white's going to lose at least one other pawn i don't think e3 can be defended we're threatening bishop takes h3 and at least just visually this looks very nasty uh 
we could also start with bishop takes h3 and then play rook takes g3, but I don't think there is more than perpetual here after king h1. I don't I don't believe that if we could lift this rook up quickly, maybe we'd be winning, but white wants to play bishop f1 and involve defender, so you could try knight e3 here. Maybe black is winning here as well, but in any case, there's multiple opportunities if white gets the knight to g3 here. So these this is positional chess, right? These subtleties. Like if you if you go for this line here, then obviously, like in comparison, you're not attacking e3. You're only threatening bishop takes e3. It's still not bad, but white can move the king aside. Um, so you just have to be very aware of what role your pieces are playing. And I talk a lot about potential energy, kinetic energy. Well, the knight has a lot of potential energy. Currently, the knight might not be doing anything, but as soon as the position opens up a little bit, whether as a result of a breakthrough or because of a sacrifice, the knight acquires tremendous power. That's why pieces often belong in the center because they're just inherently more powerful when they're in the center. Okay, so a3, a5, rook c2. Now again, I don't think white made one big mistake in this game. I think it was a series of small inaccuracies that ultimately accumulated. And this was maybe one of the most important positions in the game. When we played f6, uh, this is not an easy move to play. It's just not. Because it looks awkward. Ben Feingold laughs at you. And the massive temptation is to chase this knight away with h5 or f5. This, this is prophylaxis, right? You're not playing f5 and giving white a free outpost. You're not playing h5 and letting the knight get back into civilization on c4. You're starting with f6 and saying, I'm going to play h5 on the next move. And knight h2 was a panic reaction. I think after f5 already, we're probably close to winning. I would make the move queen e2 here with white. Who can explain the idea of this move? Why, why would I play queen e2? No idea. The queen's legs got tired. Yes, uh, real mighty turnip got it. The point is after h5, knight h2, the queen attacks the pawn on h5 and at least causes some problems for black. Now, it causes quite, quite a lot of problems for black, in fact, because if you just mindlessly play g6, this often happens. Now the rook can't come to g6. Now I would still play g6 because now black can play f5, f4, but at least at least you've created some weaknesses. No, g6 is okay because black's plan here is to play f5 and then we still have the f6 square. But that's what I would propose. Knight, knight h2 just gives us the easiest play in history. a4, again, b4, there's always on passant. And now we bring a rook into the game. And by the way, if white would have gone after our pawn on a4, there's no way we would have played knight b6. Like here, we've already crossed the bridge. All of our pieces are on the king side. We would go for something like this, and I can guarantee you this is essentially winning. And here, we absolutely do not care about, about the pawn on a4. Okay, a4 is irrelevant at this point because we're, we're already like so into the, in deep into the attack. h5, stopping knight g4 and preparing f4. And again, queen e2, I would play with white. But here we definitely go g6. Because this in no way impedes our attack down the f-file. Okay, rook f1, f4, e f4, knight f4. Now maybe, again, in the interest of time, I won't uh, talk at length about whether white had more resilient ways to deal with the attack. Maybe he did. Maybe even here, g3 was a better option. Give up one pawn instead of, you know, letting us transition into a winning endgame. But one way we could approach this is to reroute the knight to d3 and then simply go after the f2 pawn. This is and, and h4 is also potentially coming and just ripping open the king's side. So the position is lost. And after rook g3, anytime you have a knight on f4, I mean this is a tactic that you should be aware of. It exists in a million different openings. This con sometimes also with the knight on b4. I mean, just to give you an example, in the Baltic, I was teaching this to Hafu in the days of yore, um, or sorry, no, not, not cd, knight c3, 6, knight f3, knight c6, there's a trap here where white plays e3, then you play knight b4 and threaten knight c2. And so white can try to give up a pawn and intercept the bishop. After d takes e4, knight e5, you guys know where I'm going with this, there's this queen takes d4 idea. So just being aware of these tactical patterns is important uh, because they're very transferable to a lot of different positions. And immediately I saw this idea, so... We, we, we look at the different move orders. All right, can you, play, can you play it here? Well, it doesn't make sense here because after queen d4, knight d2, king h1, we're going to lose the rook on g6 at the end of the line. Okay, so let's take on g3. 
now it works and now a lot of people will just pre-move knight takes d4 but that's where you just have to slow down on every move of the combination and see whether you can't throw in an intermediate move if i tell you that there is an intermediate move here most people are going to see knight takes g3 and knight e2 that's not hard to spot you just got to keep your eyes open for this kind of stuff sub chick bingo thank you russell coons for the prime and that's it now we trade rooks knight takes d4 the final uh, point i'll make here is if white goes knight g3 this is not a scary fork because we can go e3 and the h pawn is is simply untouchable and one technique in such positions is to put the pawn on e2 and then chill because we're two pawns up we're tying white down completely and we're never afraid of knight takes e2 at least maybe we are maybe maybe we should be a little bit more careful here because here the king gets quickly to c4 although no, no no it's still us boom 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 yeah and we make it happen we play b5 and and this is winning event we're gonna push white's king away and then we're gonna start pushing our pawn so this is still winning but you have to calculate it in any case uh 93 king f7 and that's it the, the, the rest of the game is elementary my dear watson all right guys this is where i'm going to end i have a couple of things to take care of see everybody later thanks